My name is Courtney. I am the director of Tapestries, which is our memory support community here at United Methodist Communities of Pittman. Um, I am a social worker by background, and I have um, a lot of experience in senior care, in mental health, in brain injury, and in education. So just a lot of things all kind of related back to the brain. Um, so this is um, a big passion of mine. So I'm excited to be able to share some information with all of you that hopefully will help you have a better quality of interactions and a better quality of understanding about what your loved ones are going through. Um, so before we get started, anybody have anything out of the gate you want to say, need to ask, anything like that? Okay. Yep. All right, so we'll just jump right in. Um, so we're going to talk about the symptoms and stages of neurocognitive impairment. That is the fancy new term that we're moving towards as a community for dementia. Um, so it's, you can still call it dementia. They're just uh, working on rebranding it because there's not a lot of great connotation that kind of goes with the term. I think everyone hears it and gets inherently scared. So they're trying to move away from that to something a little bit more clinical. Um, but it doesn't really change what we're talking about. So, um, so just uh, a few quick points to kind of get us all on the same page before we dive in. Um, so dementia refers to a condition that causes progressive loss of cognitive function. It's a lot of big words. So um, basically the simple way to explain that is that dementia is not a disease in and of itself it's a symptom. Um, and so just as you can have a cough with a cold or a flu or COVID or cancer or a million other things, dementia is a symptom of many different illnesses. Um, but across the board, regardless of what the cause of the dementia is, there are some hallmarks that are generally the same. So everyone's experience is unique. Um, and people that have, say, Alzheimer's dementia might look a little bit different than Lewy body dementia, than Parkinson's related dementia. But for the most part, the symptoms have a lot of similarities. So, um, so just kind of know going into this that I'm talking about a very broad definition of what could happen and what you may experience. Your loved one may look exactly like what I'm describing. Your loved one may look entirely different or may have some parts and not others. And so just know that that's normal. Um, each person's experience is completely unique to them and it depends on a ton of things, their personality, their resilience, their socialization, um, which parts of the brain are affected, what type of dementia they have, just a ton of factors that go into it. So it is a very imprecise science, I guess is the best way that I can describe it. Um, and unfortunately it's so imprecise because we don't have a ton of research. Like there, there's just still so much more for us to learn about what its causes are and how it progresses and all of that. So, um, you know, it's, it's not a normal part of aging. Our goal is to get it to a place where nobody needs to experience it, but unfortunately we're just not there yet. And so the best that we can do to honor our loved ones that have it and that are going through it is to understand it and be better able to help them. So that's kind of our goal for today. Okay. Um, so uh, this is kind of a weird comparison, but I kind of think of dementia almost like pregnancy. It's got three stages. Each one gets progressively um, a little stranger <laughs> than the one preceding it. Um, so our three stages are um, either early or mild. This is the time when your loved one is still mostly independent. They might need some minor assistance, some modifications to their routine. Um, so you may have noticed this is when uh, they have struggles with remembering words or names, you'll see a lot of like, oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. What? I, I just had it. It was right there. Um, this may be when you start to notice that they're having trouble paying their bills or managing their checkbook in the way that they always had. Um, they might forget appointments, things like that. Um, meal planning, cooking, things like that that require multiple stages or a lot of organization usually get harder 
during these times, but they're still mostly independent. Um, the next stage is the middle or the moderate stage. Um, this is when they become less independent. They need more direct support. Now, direct support is a wide spectrum in and of itself. That might mean you're standing there and telling them, hey, it's time to make some breakfast. Let's get the toast. Let's put it in the toaster, Let, you know, that sort of thing. It may range all the way to needing the hands-on assistance, being there with them while they make their breakfast and walking them through every step or participating in it with them. Um, so this is the time when um, they forget, excuse me, uh, they begin, begin to get, oh my goodness, words are hard. <laughs> they begin to get more forgetful about both their daily routines and some past events, especially recent past events. So these are the times when you're like, oh, you, you were supposed to see the doctor today. And they're like, no, I didn't. But you know, they did kind of a thing. Um, this may be when you start to see confusion about what day it is, what year it is, that sort of thing. You may see increased wandering. You might see more anxiety and depression as they become more aware that they're forgetting more things than they thought. Um, you may also start to see some changes in behavior at this time in these middle and moderate stages. So that may be they're starting to have hallucinations or delusions. You might see compulsive behaviors like shuffling through papers, hoarding newspapers, magazines, mail, that sort of thing. Um, so all of that tends to be solid middle stage stuff. Um, and then the final stage is late to severe. And that is when your loved one has experienced significant declines. Um, often people in the late stages are completely dependent. So they, they may be entirely nonverbal. They may not be able to speak, to communicate. They may not be able to chew and swallow for themselves. They, they may not be able to walk, that sort of thing. So um, the brain kind of builds on itself. So our, I like to think of our brain as having a few specific parts. So there's like our the center of our brain is where our memory primarily lives. And then, um, so if you've ever seen a picture of the brain, there's like that little gooey hangy ball that kind of dangles off the back. That's where all of the essential life functions, and I'm really oversimplifying this, but that's where the essential life functions sleep and wakefulness, breathing, circulation, like motor movement, all of that stuff kind of happens in that back piece. And then um, all of that like wiggly wormy stuff that we see over top, that's where all of our higher thinking comes in. Those are the parts of the brain that develop last as we mature. They're the parts that go first as we decline. And that's true of all people. It's just a more pronounced change for a person with dementia. And so that's why we see in the early stages things like forgetfulness and forgetting words and things like that. But as the stages progress, it becomes changes in their physical ability. Um, and they may lose abilities entirely depending on the person. So there is you know, some, some why as to why that's happening and how that's progressing. And it, it's basically the, the simple rule is the, the last thing in is the first thing out, more or less. Um, the progression of dementia can take anywhere from two to 20 years on average. So that's a really wide spectrum. Um, the, the general average for most people is four to eight years from the time of diagnosis. Okay, so I've, I've seen people progress through dementia very, very quickly. We've had residents that move in and a year later, they already have progressed out just because that's their path. Um, I know my great grandmother who had dementia, she had a very slow burning kind of dementia. She had it for a solid 20 years before she passed away. Um, we've seen people that kind of stick in the, those stages for years at a time before they move on. So everybody's path through the stages and through the timeline is different. So, uh, so I just like to like you all to know that kind of going into it because 
it can be very overwhelming to not know, you know, what you're seeing and not understand what comes next. So the general symptoms, and we're going to go through each of these in more detail, but the general symptoms um, are memory and learning, uh, complex attention, executive function, which is all the good stuff that makes us good adults, our decision making, our risk assessment, all of that, um, language and speech, um, visual, spatial, and perceptual motor, which is kind of how we operate in space, um, and then personality changes and social cognition. So. Um, I think when most of us think of dementia, especially before we have the firsthand experience that, you know, you all have now, um, we tend to think just of that memory piece. This is the person that's asking the same questions over and over again, telling the same stories for the 15th time. I don't think we do a really good job culturally of, of communicating that there's all these other pieces that go into it and that it affects all these other parts of the brain. And so then when we find ourselves in that position, because a loved one has dementia, it can feel very confusing and very scary and very isolating to be like, what is going on now? Nobody prepared me for this. So that's kind of the point of today is so that you know, this is a whole spectrum of symptoms. It's not just memory. It affects every aspect of the brain, which of course affects every aspect of our lives. So that first one, again, this is the one we all think of, so it's a good place to start. Um, memory and learning is not just our ability to remember our personal details, but it's also our ability to apply that information to new situations. So, um, you know, for example, if you've ever been to a doctor's appointment, you can generalize from that experience what it'll be like to go to other doctor's appointments. If you've been to a primary care, you can guess that your dermatologist or your cardiologist is also going to have a waiting room and then an appointment room and a nurse is going to come in and then the doctor and so on. Um, for a person with dementia, that learning piece also goes. So you may find yourself having the same conversation or saying like, you've done this before, kind of, and, and wondering why that piece isn't there it may be because they've lost that ability to generalize those experiences and apply them elsewhere. So this is gonna look like our forgetfulness, our repetitive questions. It's going to affect both our short-term memory and our long-term memory. Usually short-term comes first um, with that working memory that lasts only like two to five minutes being the most profoundly impacted in the beginning. That's why you'll have them ask the same question in rapid fire succession, because that's the part that holds that information. I like to think of it as being right here. Um, and it, it just doesn't hold it. And that's often the first thing that goes. So in the early stages, this is that like, how are the kids doing? How are the kids? How have the kids been doing? Tell me what's going on in their life. And you're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> So I, I see you, Murray, you've been going oh, yeah. through this. <laughs> yes. So. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're you're not crazy. So uh, um, are you sure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although you may feel it sometimes. Um, but yeah, so this is this is that that piece that we think of. This is like the classic when we think of dementia, this is what we're picturing. Um, and so what we do for that is that we want to respond as though it's the first time every time that can be really hard to do um, you know especially as our patients wears thin but for them it really is the first time so whenever possible we want to try to honor that and kind of be in their reality in those middle or moderate stages this is when they start um, it starts to have less tie to reality so this may be where is my mother? Where is my husband? Where is my sister? Um, asking for family members that have passed away. This may be when they're telling you, you're not my daughter, my daughter is 10 years old, the kind of a thing. Um, this may be when you start to hear a lot of, I wanna go home, I need to get out of this place, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And this is because the, the part of their memory that gave context to who you are, where those people are, where they are, those pieces are gone. 
And so it's, the brain is trying its best to make logical connections and fill in the gaps, but it does it in kind of a spotty way. Um, so these are times when we want to lean into, um, we talked about a lot of this in our last meeting, for those of you that were there, we want to lean into um, our validation and our reassurance, kind of getting to the feelings beneath those fears. If I'm looking for my mother, is it because I'm uncomfortable? Is it because I'm scared? Is it because I'm hurt? Is it because I'm hungry? How can I help? What can I do for you? What do you need? Those sorts of things. Um, we may want to do a little bit of reminiscing with them. So, um, you know, where is my mother? And say, well, why don't you tell me about her so that I can help you find her? And then as they start to tell the stories, you're going to ask questions to help them get more out of the reminiscing. And gradually the focus shifts from I need to find her to I'm remembering her. Um, this is also a great time for that therapeutic fibbing, which I know some people are not super comfortable with, but this is the, um, well, mom's, mom's out at the store, she'll be back in an hour, or your kids are at school, they'll be home this afternoon. That can be a hard thing for some of us to tell our loved ones because we don't want to lie, and especially if you grew up in a household where that was like the biggest crime you could commit. It feels really weird to lie to this person that you've always been so truthful with. I try to think of it rather than being accurate as to what's kind. If they don't have the capacity to remember it and to understand it, it's no longer about truthfulness, it's about kindness. And so this that, that little fib that tells them, oh, my kids are at school, okay, that makes sense, that fits my worldview. I know they get home in the afternoon. We've assuaged the immediate anxiety related to where are my children. So we've helped the person feel better in that moment. And then by the afternoon, they've moved on to something else entirely. And so that, you know, we, we've hopefully derailed the, the distress that that could have mm -hmm. potentially caused. Um, in the late and severe stages, there really isn't much memory. Um, it is pure mindfulness. They are existing in that moment and for that moment. That can be really hard for us as caregivers, for us as loved ones to see them in that state. But for them, we want to make those moments count as much as we can. So how, what do we do at those times is that we want to make sure that their needs are met. Are they hot? Are they cold? Are they hungry? Are they in pain? Do they need to go to the bathroom? Those things. So we want to make sure their physical needs are are accounted for. And then we also want to foc focus on comforting sensations. They may or may not be able to talk to us at that time, but that doesn't mean we can't get value out of being there and we can't give them value from being there. So you can come and just hold their hand. You can come and paint their nails. You can bring some fancy hand lotion and do a little hand massage, music, singing, all great strategies for really being there in the moment with them and still giving quality to that time when they may not be able to do much more. Um, questions about the memory and learning piece? No, okay. So then the next one is complex attention. And this is like our ability to follow multiple step directions, our ability to complete complicated tasks, it's also our ability to filter out background noise to focus on the issue at hand, um, which I think is a hard thing. So at any given time, there's a thousand things going on. And so this is often what I see as the primary struggle for a lot of our residents with complex attention. Like even now, it's, it's you and your screen and my voice, right? That's the thing, but there are, you know, a dozen people on your screen and you might be noticing somebody fidgeting with their hair or you might be noticing somebody who's carrying the phone as they're walking around maybe your air conditioner is blowing and it's loud maybe it's cold and you're you know you've got that you've got kids around you've got pets around so it, we tend not to think too much about it but in any moment there's thousands of distractions and so that's often difficult for our uh for our loved ones with dementia is the ability to filter out those distractions um, 
this is where we see um, a difficulty again with that working memory, um, being able to follow through on tasks that have multiple steps. And so uh, it's important to know that pretty much any task can have multiple steps. You know, it's in some ways it's like being a child again. You know, we uh, there was a point where none of us could dress ourselves, feed ourselves, brush our own hair and teeth, that sort of thing. And as we matured, it became second nature. We've done it automatically. As we continue to age, it becomes less automatic over time. And the more energy and mental effort that it takes to focus on how we do it, the more steps it entails, the more complicated it becomes. So in those early and mild stages, um, this is the person that's easily distracted. So this is, I'm, ha I'm having a phone conversation with mom or dad, and they haven't heard the last three things I've said because their television is also on. Um, this is, I'm here to visit them in person and they can't focus on anything except what's happening in the hallway because they can see people walking by and they wanna know where they're going. Um, this might mean that they take longer to respond and to understand what you're asking them. So I, I think most people have had that experience where you ask someone to repeat themselves and then you answer their question before they've finished repeating yourself because it just took your brain a second to catch up. This is that, but to a higher degree. So they may take a little longer to respond. They may ask you to repeat yourself, not because they didn't hear, but because it just took their brain longer to process and they need to hear it again. Uh, for the middle and moderate stages, this might mean that they're completely unable to attend to you in active environments. So um, for any of you who have your loved ones in our healthcare unit, this, that's often the biggest struggle is having, you know, they, they have roommates. So it's hard to have a completely private space if you're visiting in their room mm -hmm. um, or if you're visiting in the activity area, things like that. It can be really difficult because they may not be able to focus on you and what's happening because there's so much else going around. Um, I will say that's also true of here, but here they at least have some private space and can close the door. So that can help. Um, in the late and severe stages, often the person can only focus on one point or one person. So if you come to visit in a group, you may notice that they're fixated on one person um, or that they can only attend to one person at a time before moving on. You may notice that they are staring at a fixed point in space. Uh, in those late stages, it can take up to 90 seconds to process a simple sentence. 90 seconds is an eternity. If you've, if you've ever had a conversation with an awkward silence, I guarantee you that awkward silence was no more than four or five seconds and it felt endless. Um, 90 seconds is a lifetime for, for us. For them, it's their normal at this stage. Um, and so what we wanna do is be careful to allow for that time. So across the board, what we do to handle this is that we minimize distractions whenever possible. Um, we allow for time to process. And of course, how much time we allow is going to depend on where our loved one is. So you'll, and you'll figure that out as you go. You likely already know where your loved one is. The changes tend to happen gradually. So you'll grow with them. Um, we wanna use short sentences and simple language. It's important to know that that does not mean talking to them like they're stupid. <laughs> uh, we don't want to talk to them like they're children. We don't want to um, hurt their, you know, hurt their pride, hurt their dignity, or you know, reduce them in our vision either um, by speaking down to them. That's, you know, they they deserve more than that. Um, but we do want to use simple language whenever possible. So this isn't like oh, honey, would you like a cookie? This, this is like, would you like something to eat? And when they say yes, would you like a cookie or would you like a banana? Or would you like a pack of chips? You know, whatever the case may be, giving clear sentences, keeping them short. Um, whenever possible, if we do need to repeat ourselves, we wanna use the same language that we used the first time. So I know, um, it can be habit to change our wording around thinking that we're helping. So, hey, why don't you come sit with me? Hey, come sit here by me. 
why don't you come sit down? Let's have a chat. Every time you do that, you restart their clock for understanding. So if you can, you want to try to use the same verbiage over and over again. And whenever possible, you want to use sensory supports. So we want to bring in smells. We want to bring in things to look at, textures to feel, things like that. So, and that's especially true the further along in your dementia that your loved one is. So the sensory takes up a much bigger portion when our loved one is in those later stages. Um, any questions about any of that? Okay. So then the next one is executive function. And again, this is that piece that makes us good adults. This is our decision-making, our risk assessment, our judgment, all of those, our ability to follow through, um, all of those fun things. So if any of you have had teenagers, this is the part that's not fully developed yet. That's why they are infuriating. <laughs> um, they grow out of it, fortunately. Um, so for, but for our loved ones at this end of the spectrum, this is why sometimes I know I've heard many of you say, it's like I'm talking to my child. And, and that's why, because the parts of the brain that make us good adults are the last to develop, but they're also the first to go. And so in some ways it can feel very much like talking to a teenager that just doesn't understand. So, um, in the early stages, this is when we might see um, that they're very likely to um, be victim of internet or phone or television scams. If somebody calls and tries to sell them an extended warranty, if they get an email from the Nigerian prince that's trying to reclaim his throne, whatever the case may be, they are far more likely to fall victim to that type of, of scam because well, he was nice and I have it to spare, so why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of a thing. Um, we may start to see changes in normal behavior. Um, so, and changes in normal behavior can look like a lot of things. This might be, I used to be really social and now I would prefer to stay home. This might be, I'm rummaging through my drawers all the time and I can never seem to find what I'm looking for. It might be, I used to shower every day and I was always dressed to the nines and now I can't be bothered with any of that kind of thing. So um, some changes in normal behavior. We want to, um, whenever possible, we wanna make accommodations as needed. So like if they're go likely to fall into that, like, let me just give this person a lot of money. It's a good sign it's time for you to take over the finances you know, that sort of thing. Um, for changes in behavior, this is a tricky one because we want to make sure that we're asking ourselves, who is this really a problem for? Um, and I'll tell you, often the answer is you, not them. And, and that's not that you're doing anything wrong. It's just human nature. You know your parent to have been the same person all of your life and suddenly they're starting to change in ways that can be hard to understand and harder even still to accept. And so every time they deviate a little from what we expect of them and who we know them to be, it can be really um, heartbreaking. And there can be this intense instinct to make it right. Like, no, you have to do that thing. It was so important to you to go to church every week. It was so important to you to make sure that every day your hair was perfect or whatever the case may be. At the end of the day, fighting with them about those things may end up making things worse and not better. So that's kind of the goal of asking yourself, like, who is this really a problem for? Is this really a problem at all? Um, in the middle stages, this is, again, that they've lost that contextual memory. So this is a person who hasn't driven in 10 or 15 years saying, of course I can drive. What are you talking about? Where are my keys? How dare you take them from me? Um, this is the, the person that's like, I don't live here. I have a house. It's right around the corner. Somebody needs to mow my lawn. Somebody needs to take care of my cat, like those sorts of things. Um, so whenever possible for that, we want to avoid the argument. We want to um, 
be present in their reality if we can. Okay, so um, so we don't want to argue. We may just say, like, sure, your you know your car is in the parking lot, but why don't we take mine? You know that sort of thing. Um, or your car is in the shop. That's a great one if you <laughs> you don't feel comfortable with that. Oh, you you needed an oil change or you needed some new tires. They're taking care of it. It should be ready in a couple of days. That sort of thing. Um, this is a great time for diversion and redirection. Try to get them involved in something else if you can. So um, yeah, of, of, of course you're ready to go home, but first why don't we you know, look at these photos? I really want you to tell me the story behind this kind of a thing to get them involved in that. Um, and then this last point is turtle tactics. This is kind of a weird name. Um, if you've ever found a turtle in the road, and you are the kind of person that wants to help the turtle in the road, often we think we need to pick up the turtle and move it back. The reality of the situation is that we, if we really wanna get the turtle out of the road, we need to move it the direction it's facing because it had a goal. It was going there for a reason. So if we move it to the side of the road that's closest, the side that it came from, it's gonna keep walking into the road every time. And we actually set it up for failure because it gets progressively more tired, progressively slower, progressively more dangerous. Same is kind of true for our loved ones. So whenever possible, we want to help them succeed at what they're doing mm -hmm. and what they want to mm -hmm. do so that we can scratch that itch and they can move on to the next part of their day. It's important to know here that that may not look like, you know, if they want to go home, it may not be that you're able to take them to a house they've sold. It may not be that they're able to go and visit. So this might be like, you want to get out of here? Yeah, let's go for a ride. Go ahead and get them in the car. Take them anywhere, you know, go get some ice cream, come back. They'll have forgotten that their goal was to go home by the time they, you know, they get out the door because that was the goal. Um, it may be that they want to eat something maybe they shouldn't, you know, you're, you're diabetic, maybe you shouldn't have the ice cream cone. They can eat the ice cream cone. Um, it's it's kind of counterintuitive, but the, the research backs up that it is far more dangerous for an elderly person to refuse them what they want than it is to enforce a restrictive diet. So we, we, we go with it. Whenever possible, you want to help them achieve their goal. And that helps to build and maintain trust as we go through as well. Um, in those late stages, this might mean that they're unable to make even simple decisions, unable to communicate even simple things. So where in the earlier stages, we might say, what do you want to wear today? And they can tell us, oh, I want to wear my blue shirt and my black pants. In the middle stages, we're probably going to present two choices and have them choose one. In the late stages, we're going to make a choice based on what we know they like. So this is when we're gonna use our empathy and our compassion to make a decision for them that is true to who they are as best as we know. Okay, so if you know they had a favorite shirt, that's what you're gonna put on them. If you know that there's a color or a texture they particularly liked, that's what you're gonna pick. Um, we always want to make sure that those decisions that we're making on their behalf honor their values and their dignity. Um, I think this is a really hard part. Um, it sounds like it shouldn't be, <laughs> uh, but it's a really hard part because what is best for them in that moment may be different than what was best for them at a previous time in their lives. So, um, it may be like an example that comes to mind is for, for people, people are often grossly incontinent at this stage. And you may be thinking, well, I know they just soiled themselves mm -hmm. and we need to get them changed so that they're not sitting in it. That's accurate and true. Yes, of course. But they may not want you to see them in that state. They may not be comfortable with the fact that you're there and you're present while they're 
um, while they're being cleaned. They may not want to be cleaned until after the visit is over because they don't want your impression of them to change. Um, and that's just really one example, but there are a lot of things like that where what what is right in some senses is not necessarily what is right for them. So that's that's kind of the challenge. And, and so I wish that there was a clear and dry answer I could give to say in those moments, but just know that if you're doing your best, you're doing your best, so, and that's good enough. Um, any questions about this one? Yeah. Okay. Um, Courtney, I, sure. I do, when you're talking about incontinence, I have wondered about this, but didn't get a chance to actually talk to you about it, mm -hmm. that, um, that when I'm in there, with her, I know that, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, this is something that she has to do all the time by herself. Anyhow, do I like, like in the bathroom, um, I'm letting her get up off the toilet, but if I am there, I end up helping her like pulling up the depends, pulling up her pants. Um, should I not be doing that because this is something that she has to do by herself anyhow? Um, I would say as a general rule, we want to preserve as much independence as possible. Right. So if a person is capable of doing it on their own, we want to let them do it on their own. Right. Um, that's how we preserve as much function as possible for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. So you can absolutely step back and let her take the lead on it. Okay. If she asks for help, by all means, or if she appears to be struggling, by all means, hop in if you're comfortable doing that or come get okay. someone's help if you're, you know, if the situation calls for it and that that's totally fine. Um, but, but if, if she's capable, I would say, um, let her do it alone. Okay. And that's also part of that, um, part of that dignity thing that often, and this is not just for toileting, but across the board, often it is easier and faster for us to do the thing for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, especially if we're crunched for time or if we're already frustrated because it happens, it's challenging sometimes to visit. Um, it, we can have that instinct of like, it'll just be better if I help you. That doesn't necessarily preserve that dignity. You know, we, so if it, if it takes a little more time to let them do the thing on their own, but they can go ahead and give them that time whenever possible. Right. Okay. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times she'll, um, like, like even yesterday, you know, she was, she's saying, I'm, you know, I'm so afraid I'm going to fall and, and then, you know, can you, can you help me? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm saying to her, well, only because I'm right here, you know? Well, and there's, there's definitely a piece to this that is um, the comfort in the relationship and the, um, the learned helplessness that's also definitely a thing. So when, when we try to preserve people's independence, when we try to let them do what we know they can, we're trying to avoid that learned helplessness of if I help you with a thing that you can do, you're going to start to always want help in that regard. And then it's a very quick walk to yeah, now right. you can't do that thing anymore on your own. So we, we want to prevent that whenever we can, but it's also a, an interpersonal dynamic and a personal relationship thing. So I, I can say with your mom specifically, she's not asking us for that level of help. Mm -hmm. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean she doesn't need that level of help she may just be more comfortable asking you for it. And so she's content to struggle through and do it on her own. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, I've, I've seen both. I've seen residents that would prefer for their family members to do those tasks. I don't want you, I don't know you, they know me there. I'm comfortable with them. That's who I want here. That's fine. We have residents where it's the total opposite no, I don't want you to see me in that way. I want the professional to do it. And that's also fine. So it's really like a person to person situation. So I would say if she's asking you for help, it's okay to give her that help. 
Okay. But if it just seems like she's struggling mm-hmm. and you want to go in and, and, and make it a little quicker and a little easier, that may be a time where you want to hold off a little bit more until she asks for help. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Um, it's also important to note that as we go through the stages in the later moderate stages and especially in the late to severe stages, they may not be able to ask for the help that we need. And so at those times you're looking for the cues. Do they look distressed? Do they seem frustrated? Is, you know, is, is it just not happening the way that it always did? And at those times, absolutely step in. Okay. Okay. All right, so then this next one is visual, spatial, and perceptual motor. Oh, I skipped language and communication. I thought I went too fast. Um, Okay, so the next one is language and communication. So this is not only our words, um, not only what we say, but also what we hear and how we understand it. This is also reading and writing. So um, it kind of all goes together. So especially for those of us that have loved ones that are hard of hearing, you may at times rely on writing to them when they can't hear, um, just so that you have some warning, there may be a time when that is no longer a viable option either. So um, in the early stages, that's the, um, it's on the tip of my tongue. I just had it, what's that word? It may be the, oh, you know what I mean. Um, I see a lot of sentences trailing off. Oh, we had such a good time doing the, you know, that that thing. Um, It was a really fun time. We should do that again. And and kind of disguising what it is that they don't remember. Um, Whenever you can, fill in the blanks. If you can't, go on the journey. Um, So I will tell you my grandmother before she passed, she had dementia and she, every single time I saw her, remind me to tell you later about that thing. Just remind me to tell you that thing later. Okay, granny, sure. She never remembered what the thing she needed to tell me was, but she was always going to tell me later. So, um, yeah, I'll remind you later. And then later, hey, Granny, did you remember what you wanted to tell me? All right, I'll remind you again later. No problem. So it's okay. Just go with it. Um, We definitely want to uh, use humor whenever possible, both for their sake and for ours. So when um, when we start to see things slipping, it can be a little intimidating. And it's often very scary for them too, especially in those early stages when they're still aware that things are changing. Um, And so whenever possible, you want to use humor to to kind of gloss over the situation and make it a little less tense and fill in those gaps for them if you can. Um, In the moderate stages, we're going to see a lot of um, using words more generally. And they tend to be big words that we think of as having one meaning. So, you know, mom, home, to us, with healthy brains, mom is a specific person. This is the person who birthed you and raised you. Home is a specific place. It's where we live. It's where we go back to at the end of every day. It's where we live our lives and raise our families, all that stuff. As we get further into dementia, these words become um, grander and more general. So mom is no longer the person that birthed and raised me. She is that, but this is also the person who loves me. This is the woman that takes care of me. This is the person that makes me feel safe and comfortable and loved. This is the person who helps me when I'm upset or when I don't feel well. So it becomes a much broader category. Um, And so many of you I know have had the experience of your, your mother's or father's calling you their parents. This may be what's going on there. Um, we may see um, that they take more time to respond. Again, that's that piece where it can take the brain up to 90 seconds. So what we do on this, again, go with that journey. So if they're calling you mom, it's not really a problem, 
Okay. Just know that mom is a woman that loves me and cares for me. And if they're calling you mom, they know you love them and they know you care for them. That's a good thing. Okay. So kind of lean into that. Um, if we, you know, if same for words like home, same, you know, same for children. These are the little, the, the little people I care for. Where are my children? They might be talking about grandchildren, things like that. So, um, yeah, so whenever possible, we want to go on the journey. Again, we want to use that short, simple language that we talked about before, and we want to allow more time for them to process what we're saying and for them to put together their own thoughts. Um, it's also worth pointing out at this point that we may see them for some people. Um, some people may have more trouble with expressive aphasia, which is, so they may have more trouble finding their own words, but they're completely fine hearing and understanding what you're saying to them. For some people, it's more receptive aphasia. So it may be that they can tell you all about it all day long, but that they can't seem to understand what you're saying. Um, and some people get um, the wires crossed and they may start to use words in different ways than they ever have before. Um, I always think of one of my very first job in senior care, we had a gentleman that had, um, it wasn't dementia related, he had a stroke, but he had this particular type of aphasia. And so there were kind of code words that he would use that wasn't what the item was called, but it was consistently what he knew it as. And so he would often ask for big red machines for his scrambled eggs. And he was talking about ketchup, but his mm -hmm. brain could not remember the word for ketchup and couldn't put the word for ketchup out of his mouth, but it could say big red machines. And so that's what he would ask for. And once we figured that out, it was a much easier day, <laughs> you know? Um, but so you may see that in your own loved ones that words start to take the place of other words and you may just need to kind of figure out what their new language is, mm. which is definitely a struggle. Um, Oh, I see a hand raised. Did somebody have a question? Yes, I okay. did. Okay. <laughs> um, I was wondering in this or in which one of these stages, um, the writing down as a reminder, like reading their own writing mm -hmm. and deciphering it. My mom has started saying, because um, I've encouraged her to keep a, a calendar and just write down like three things that happened today or you know, if somebody comes to visit. And then when I call, she can refer to it to know what she did today. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, you know, she's only been there not even a week, right? But there were great, there were two really good days and then, she says, well, this is great. I'm looking at this and I can't even understand what I was trying to write down. And she saw the word rain and kept talking about the weather. And it was the day there was the rainbow and she went knocking on everybody's door and she couldn't connect rainbow mm -hmm. for rain. You know, I just don't know. Like, is, is that a bad idea to tell her to write a couple things down a day or? I don't think it's a bad idea. Um, so she, she's, she's very much still in the early stages. So again, the more you let her do and the more, the more she uses of her skills, the longer she's going to retain those skills and the better off she's going to be. So what I would say for you is just to manage your expectations of what that's going to look like, because there are going to be good days where she can write down three things and she knows exactly what they mean. And seeing that note is enough to remind her. She's gonna have bad days where she either doesn't remember to write it down or she writes down a code word that she thought was very clear in the moment, but just wasn't when she goes back to it. I know I'm good for that even myself in like the prime of life, so to speak for brain health. So I really am not gonna fault her for that. Um, you know, and, and everything in between. So I, I don't think that it's a bad thing too, but I would just say if she's having one of those days where she doesn't remember to write or where she doesn't remember why what she wrote was significant to just kind of gloss past that part of the conversation so that she doesn't get stuck in that moment and feel anxious and feel disappointed with herself because of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Because I thought it was interesting that 
she kept talking about the rain and eventually she got to after the rain and she got to rainbow, you know, it okay. just took five minutes. Um, but I just didn't want to frustrate her if she can't read what she's writing down. I just didn't want that to be frustrating. So, yeah. And I, I will say across the board for all of our residents, they have these good days and bad days. Um, they have even moment to moment. Sometimes they'll have these super crystal clear moments of clarity. And then the very next sentence is just completely off the wall, you know? So, um, so I would say if it's still working, keep, keep going with it. Just be prepared to kind of like, ah, that's all right. Let's talk about this instead kind of a thing so that she doesn't get stuck on it and get anxious because the goal in everything that we do is how do we minimize distress for the person? So, um, you know, so I know forgetting what they've done in a day can be very distressing and she's definitely very much at that point from what I see. So the writing down helps that. So it's still a good tool. If the recall of the writing isn't a hundred percent, we keep it moving before it puts her in that state of distress again. So it's just the name of the game in everything we do where, where a loved one with dementia is concerned is flexibility. Just be prepared to roll with whatever, you know, whatever the situation throws at you and just keep it moving. So, um, but yeah, by all means, let her keep going. So, okay. Okay. Um, I will say a lot of them get very uncomfortable with their handwriting as they go. It's not the, it's not the penmanship they were once proud of. And as their vision goes to, which is often the case that they struggle more and more to read it. And so it, it may not be purely dementia based that she's having trouble with. It might be that her hand was a little shaky or that she just can't see clearly that, you know, that day. And so there's, there's a lot going on there. So it, especially in these early stages, I'm hesitant to say that it's a purely dementia based yeah. issue. So, um, all right. And then in those late and severe stages, it's, um, it may be that they don't understand at all. So, um, the, the jury is kind of out on this and, um, many times it depends on the person. Um, but they, they may or may not understand what you're saying. They may or may not be able to indicate that they understand what you're saying. They may or may not be able to speak themselves. Um, and so these, especially for the, um, for the family are really hard times because it again makes that communication piece so hard. And these are the times when we want to, again, assess for needs. Are they in pain? Are they uncomfortable? Are they hot? Are they cold? Are they hungry? all of that stuff, um, make sure that their needs are met. And from there, focus on comfort. So I can say where, um, where language fails, music still connects. That's been studied and proven just like a million times as far as dementia patients are concerned, especially. Um, I've seen it firsthand. I know, um, Shortly after I started, we had a resident that was in this end stage of dementia and it was in the height of COVID and her, um, her family, for whatever reason, was not able to be here as she was passing. And so I was spending a lot of time with her in her room so that she wouldn't be passing on her own. She couldn't talk anymore and hadn't been able to for months. Um, it wasn't really clear that she understood what I was saying. Um, but I can tell you that when I sang, and I'm not a good singer, just so you know, um, that when I sang, she visibly calmed down. At those times, she was less restless. She was, uh, there was less like kind of agitated movement, less calling out. So nonverbal does not mean silent. That's an important thing to note. Um, so less calling out, less discomfort, and she just looked more at peace. And I wasn't singing anything. I wasn't singing well, and I wasn't singing anything difficult. A lot of it was like the ABCs, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, just familiar songs that everybody knows, because when you're sitting with a person for two hours, you pretty much run out of everything else. So um, I will say, uh, they say that Let, uh, Let Me Call You Sweetheart is one of the most recognizable songs of all time. So um if you know the words to that one, you can definitely pull that one out of your uh, out of your toolbox at the time. 
if you don't know the words to that one, you can learn it. It's a, it's a classic. I know our choir sings it and they all love it, but they say for whatever reason that that's one of the most recognizable songs of all time. And so we, that's a good go-to when you're looking for a way to connect with somebody when you're just not sure whether or not it's hitting home. Any questions about that one? Okay. All right, so now we'll get to visual, spatial, and perceptual motor. So this is, again, that how we operate in space and time. This is where we are in the world around us. So um, this may be inability to recognize faces or common objects. This might be the inability to find objects in our visual field. So if you've ever been looking for something and it's right in front of your face, but you just couldn't find it, that might be what's going on. Um, I know that I'm good for that. Um, this is also indicated by how our body moves through time and how we interact with our environment. So you may see um, things, well, and I'll, I'll break this down into the stages, but, but like things like floor transitions, like if one section of the floor is carpeted and then the next, the adjacent room is tiled or hardwood, that might be a difficult thing for the person to navigate because their brain can't make sense of that change and what it means for where they can stand and where they can walk kind of a thing. Um, this might be like my hands don't don't go where I think I'm putting them, so to speak. So buttoning buttons, feeding themselves may become an issue, that sort of thing. Um, so in the early stages, this is um, losing things all the time, misplacing them. Um, this might be, especially for those that are still in the community and that are very independent, this might be like, I, I put the brakes on, I stopped in time, I don't know what happened. That light turned red too quick, kind of a thing. Um, so it, it's just their brain's ability to calculate the distance and make the change in time wasn't there. Um, so at those times we wanna offer reassurance we want to, we can do that turtle tactic to help them meet their goal thing whenever possible, as long as it's not a safety issue. So like obviously driving is a, is a tough one, um, but there are plenty of other things that we can let them do that we can be there with to support them for their safety um, and uh, offer assistance. And so the, the big thing in offering assistance is that we have to think like they think and they don't think like we do. So um, I can tell you, if any of you have ever come and your loved one has said, I can't find this or it's been stolen, um, we hear that a lot. Most of the time when we think about something we've lost, we sat it down and forgot where we put it or it fell out of a pocket. And so we're checking places like under the sofa cushions and you know, I set a bunch of things down in the refrigerator. Did I leave it in the kitchen? So we're checking those sorts of things. Often for a person with dementia, it's not that it's lost, it's that it's hidden. So they may think this is a valuable item. I need to put it away in a safe place and they hide it. And then they forget that they've hidden it. They forget where they've hidden it. And so now it's either lost or it must've been stolen. And, and we, as the people that love them and are going in and trying to help them look for their remote control, their hearing aid, things like that, we're going to look on between the sofa cushions, under the bed, in those places where we lose things, when what we really should be looking at is their underwear drawer and their bedside table drawers and things like that, where they may have hid something of value that they didn't want somebody to find. So that's kind of the tricky part is you have to put yourself in their shoes and we don't always know what's going on in there to be able to do that. So, so whenever possible, we wanna offer assistance, but just know that it might be difficult to do that. Um, in the middle or moderate stages, we may see them walk into things. Um, I've seen people look straight at a wall or straight at a chair and still walk into it, still trip over it. Um, this may be that their eyes aren't working anymore, but often it's that their eyes and their brain aren't communicating in the same way that they used to. So they're just not able to interpret the information that their eyes are giving them the same way. Um, they might have difficulty finding things in plain sight. Uh, they may not 
know who you are instinctively. And I think this for family members is often one of the hardest things when you come to visit and your, you know, your mother or your father is saying, who are you? And you're telling them, well, I'm your daughter, I'm your son. And they're like, no, (laughs) you're not. Or, and it may be that they're not able to visually process what they're seeing. So sometimes it's that they remember that they remember you as children and that you're much younger and and you're not the little child that they expect you to be. Um, But it may also be that their brain isn't interpreting what they're seeing and that they're not able to match what they're seeing in front of them with the image of you that they have in their head. So I know that that's a, a really emotional one for a lot of family members, but just know that it doesn't mean that they've forgotten you. It's just the, the puzzle pieces aren't put together the way they should. Uh, so at those times, we want to use reassurance and gentle reminders. So, um, you know, well, I'm, you know, it's, it's me, Courtney, I'm your granddaughter, you know, that sort of thing. Um, or, you know, it's okay. We've, even if you don't want to correct them, you can go with, well, I, you know, I care about you and I come to visit a lot. And so I'm just happy to spend some time with you. And it's okay to gloss over the relationship because you know, you love them and they know that they love you and that's enough. You know, Um, we want to try to go on the journey when we can. So if they're, um, if they're struggling to look for things, feel free to help them search. If you, if they're looking for the remote and you can see that it's plainly on the table, maybe you want to make a little show of looking harder for it than you need to so that they're not embarrassed when you're like, it's right there. (laughs) Um, and, and mostly don't take it personally because it's really not that they don't remember you. It's not that they don't love you. It's that there's changes going on in their brain that doesn't allow them to express it and to connect the dots as well as they once did. Um, And so in the late and severe stages, we may see this as um, hallucinations. Um, We may see restlessness or unusual behaviors. um, And we may see that they're unresponsive to visual stimuli. So so hallucinations are extremely common. It's not, you know, it's not late onset schizophrenia. If you weren't schizophrenic in your 40s, you're not schizophrenic in your 80s. That's not how it works. it's that the brain self-stimulates. So when the brain isn't able to interpret the information that the eyes are sending, or when the brain isn't getting enough information from the eyes, it'll make stuff up. Uh, It's important to know that that's true across the board. Whenever the brain can't fill in the gaps, it will make what it believes is the most logical conclusion. Um, That's called confabulation. So if you've ever been like, why is my mom telling this wild lie? it's probably because there's a nugget of truth there in the center and she's just tacking on whatever makes sense that goes around it to explain what's happening. Um, so, so just know that, but especially with regard to the vision centers, um, often people will hear or see things not because they suddenly have developed this, you know, this new psychiatric symptom, but because the brain is trying to entertain itself. It's trying to keep as much of that sim- Um, signaling going as possible. And it's doing that by creating stimuli where there isn't any. Um, So being unresponsive to visual stimuli, it might mean that they don't react when you're in there, like when they see you, um, or if you go to show them something that they may not have a response to it. Um, Again, it's just the eyes aren't sending the signal. So it's not that they don't care. It's that they they can't understand what they're seeing. And restlessness is pretty self-explanatory. Unusual behaviors is a whole host of things. So um, I can say, I know we've we've had residents where unusual behaviors might be sudden, um, like they become suddenly very sexual almost, like they were never a touchy-feely kind of person before, but suddenly they're grabbing your butt. Um, It may be that, you know, that they're, they're packing and unpacking their things repeatedly, or that they're constantly rooting through the same items, looking for the same things over and over again. It may be, um, you know, that they're tucking, tucking food or objects, like trying to hide things in their clothing, all kinds of strange things. Um, So it just, it's just part of 
the the weird way the brain tells them to interpret the world and how they're trying to do um, how they're trying to do that and how they're trying to make sense of it. So it's a whole spectrum of stuff. But if you see that they're doing something a little bit strange, it's likely that the their brain has decided there's a reason for that behavior. It's up to us to figure out how we interpret that. Um, so the biggest things here are that we want to refrain from judgment. We don't ever want to look at our loved one and think they've they've lost it. They're completely nuts. <laughs> you know, um, that's not doing us or them any favors. Um, we always want to assist for safety. This is a big one at this time. So if again, is this a problem and who is it a problem for? If they're okay, if they're safe, it's okay. If they're really restless, it may be that they're in pain and that they're not able to communicate that with you. It may be that they're really uncomfortable, like maybe they have to go to the bathroom and they're not able to communicate that with you. So we always wanna make sure that we're addressing those things. Um, and again, using other sensory stimuli whenever we can. So smells and sounds and um, tactile touch is really important. So things that are pleasant to hold and to, to feel, things like that can be really powerful. Um, any questions about the visual, spatial and perceptual motor? Okay. Um, and this is our last major symptom, and this is um, personality changes and social cognition. So this is the way that we interact with people and the way that we present ourselves to the world. Um, this one can be fun and funny at times, and it can be infuriating at other times. So um, so just know that that's not because something is, you know, wrong. It's just, it's okay to laugh or it's okay to be aggravated. You just got to ro roll with the punches, so to speak. Um, so this may be changes in mood. It might be increased agitation or apathy, not caring about things that they used to care immensely about. Um, they may refrain from things they used to love. They may be in increasingly socially isolated. They may not have an understanding of how other people feel in the moment. They might do things that they would never have done before. So their inhibitions are lowered um, and they may have a limited awareness of what's socially acceptable behavior. So um, in the early stages, often what we see is social isolation for people that had always been very social. Often that this is that they're embarrassed, that they have just enough awareness of their struggles that they don't want other people to see them struggling. And so rather than go and spend time with friends or go and spend time with family, they're gonna make up an excuse not to go, oh, I've got a headache, oh, I'm not feeling so well, I'm not, I'm not really up to it, or you know, I, I don't wanna be there. And it's because they don't want other people to see them. And the more time the other people spend with them, the more likely they are to realize that something isn't quite right. Um, they might be easily embarrassed or irritable, um, easily argumentative, that sort of thing. Um, that can be really frustrating for all of you as family members and caregivers, because often you're the people they take out most of those frustrations on. So they, they love you, they know you love them, they can trust you with those unpleasant parts of themselves, which is a good thing, even if it stinks to constantly be the target of their frustration. Uh, so at those times, we want to use our humor and our empathy whenever possible. So we want to try to understand what they're going through. We want to try to, um, to make light of things when we can. That is a tightrope walk because we don't want to belittle something that's very serious for them. So, you know, you have to kind of take what you know of your loved one into consideration for that. Um, we definitely want to offer encouragement. I see a lot of people in this stage that as they forget things or as they're with people that they are um, very hard on themselves. I'm so stupid. Why can't I remember this? I'm such an idiot. And that is just heartbreaking to watch. So, um, so we wanna offer a lot of encouragement. You're not stupid, I do that all the time. Maybe share a story about a time when you had a, just a really awful brain fart and, and help it feel a little more normal. Um, we definitely wanna avoid arguing with them. 
it's only going to create frustration and alienation where what they really need is connection. So, um, you know, so if they're, if, if you really want them to go to the family barbecue and they are absolutely insistent that they're not going, it's okay. Maybe they go to the next one. Or maybe you bring a couple of family members to visit them in a space where they're a little, you know, a little more familiar, a little more comfortable. Or maybe you choose a smaller gathering. You know, um, I know a lot of our residents at this stage are would love to be with their families all the time, but are not really comfortable with the big functions. And they tend to burn out around the one or two hour mark. And then the, you know, and then you're in the position of like, how do I leave and get them home right now? So it it may be that you want to shorten the time span or that you want to make the group a little smaller so that it's less overstimulating for them and so that they feel less pressure to put on the show and pretend to be, you know, who they've always been as they're struggling. Um, in the middle and moderate stages, um, they can often only think about their own needs in the moment. So it tends to look as, it tends to look like very selfish, um, self-centered behavior. It's not that they suddenly don't care about you and what you need and who you are. It's that they can't think past that. Um, so again, we wanna try not to take that personally. We do wanna address their needs whenever we can. Um, this is also when we tend to see the loss of the social filter. Um, so this is when they say really inappropriate things really loudly in places you wish they hadn't. Um, and they tend to pick the low hanging fruit. Um, the things that are obvious and easy to pick on. So you'll get comments about weight, about age, about race, about all kinds of super fun things that people are very sensitive about. Um, and it, it can be, uh, it can be really hard. So I, I know we have I might have told this story last time, I don't remember, but we have a resident that every time she sees me, she goes, oh, that's a big woman. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not little, <laughs> so she's not wrong. Um, we've had people say, oh, look at the behind on that one. You know, that kind of thing, which is a little, a, a, a little upsetting if they say it every time you walk past them. Um, but the, it's, it's just, it's truly that their brain has lost the awareness of when it is and is not appropriate to say those things. And so it popped in their head and it popped out their mouth. And it's their way of trying to engage with you, even if it is a little embarrassing at times um, or a little infuriating or upsetting at times. So I, again, humor is a really good tool to help you manage that moment. And just, you know, when you can try to gloss over it for them because correcting the behavior isn't really um, effective and it's likely only going to create more conflict where you don't need it. Um, in the late and severe stages, this is often that they can't connect with people independently at all. So they're not going to reach out to you and say, you know, hey, I really want you to come and visit. They may not be able to speak at all. They may not be able to reach out to you at all. They may be able to do those things, just not in the way that they once did. Um, but they're going to need you to take the lead on that. So it's going, you know, it's going to be that the the burden is on you to create those interactions. Um, we want to make sure that we're doing that at their level, and this is really true across the board. It's especially true in the late stages, but it's true across the board. You know, obviously, we're not going to bring. Um, you know, complicated knitting patterns to a person that's, you know, bedridden and having trouble with their vision. So, um, you know, we might want to bring, you know, just some nice soft yarn or a blanket that they've already made and use that as the basis for the interaction kind of a thing. Um, again, that use of sensory input. I know I've said that a lot throughout the, the course of the, um, the whole thing and with many of the symptoms, but in the late stages, it's so important that we engage a lot of different senses at once to help them create a vision of their world when their vision may not work, when their hearing may not work, when they may not be able to speak. And so the, the more senses we can stimulate, the fuller the picture we give them of their lives in that moment, if that makes sense. Um, questions about this one? 
Okay. So that's pretty much all the state, um, all the stages and all the symptoms across the board in a nutshell. Um, of course, like as I said in the beginning, everybody's progression is different, everybody's timeline is different, everybody's specific kind of constellation of symptoms is different. Um, I've had residents that could remember every single person's name and call everyone by name, but could not tell you, um, you know, why they were here at all. And it's like, how do you know all of us if you've never been here before in your life? <laughs> There's not really rhyme or reason to it. Um, I've had residents that might remember really detailed information one day and that may not the next. And um, I, I hear a lot of, well, they wouldn't forget a thing like that. That's really important. Well, it's, it's not about whether or not it's important. It's about what the brain is capable of. And, um, and that's constantly changing throughout our entire lives. And at, at these times, it's just changing rapidly. So just something that we want to be aware of, you know, the, that this is a real struggle. And as hard as it is for us as their loved ones and as the people watching them go through these stages um, and trying to figure out how to help them navigate these stages and how to figure out how, to, how we navigate them without losing our minds, uh, as hard as it is for us, it's harder for them that, you know, they're, they're the ones that are, that are losing pieces of themselves and they're the ones that are changing um, their realities every day and that are having to make concessions that they never thought they would have to make. And so we want to try to keep that place of empathy and understanding central to us when we're having those moments where we're, you know, frustrated or we're upset because we want to try to make their lives as good as possible. And it's okay for us to leave those interactions and then go vent our feelings to other people. But whenever possible, we don't want to take out those feelings on them when they're already struggling. Okay. So, um, I kind of think of it as like a bullseye. The person at the center is always allowed to dump everything they're dealing with out. We only dump love and support in towards the center. We only dump frustration and anger out away from the center. So find your network of people that you can do that with, that, that can support you so that when you have that hard moment with mom or dad, you're, you're not feeling like I need to argue with them in this moment. You can just, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you can go to your support team and say whatever you wish you could have said in that moment that didn't quite fit. Um, mm -hmm. And, and know that we are here to be part of that team. If you're having a moment, if you're frustrated, if you don't understand why they're doing what they're doing, um, if you just are overwhelmed with the responsibility and the hardship of being a caregiver, because it is hard and it is scary, we're here for that. We're happy to help with any of it in whatever way we can. Anybody have any closing questions, comments about anything we discussed today? Just thank you, it's very helpful. Okay, good. Great program, Courtney, thank you so much. Very involved and extensive and I'm, and I'm sure that each of these stages and phases overlap because I, I can see you know, uh, so much where so much of this started with my own mother. So much, so many years before we actually diagnosed her. But um, this was a nice little presentation. Appreciated it. Oh, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm I'm happy it helps. I know we don't really get a lot of this kind of information, and and when we get the diagnosis, usually we've already been struggling with it for a while. And, yep. and usually we're trying to make sense of what it means moving forward. And so we don't necessarily think to ask, like, what should I expect? And, and some of us have had many family members that have gone through this. And then, you know, we think we know what to expect because we've had that experience. And then we get a complete curveball, you know, because everybody's mm -hmm. so different. So, mm -hmm. sure. so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to to be able to create a bigger picture. Um, and you raise a good point, I think, in what you said, um, that you can be in a different stage for different things. Mm -hmm. So you might be in a moderate or like even a severe stage 
um, with regard to communication, but still be completely physically capable um, and, and everything in between. So it's, it's, not, it's not linear, it's not cut and dry. It's very, like very, very individualized, it's extremely mm -hmm. deep for each person. You know, one other thing I was going to say that I, one of the things I love about your facility, your staff is, is the respect for it, the individuality of each of your residents because everybody is so different. Like I know, I know when I come visit, some residents always say hi and greet me. You know, they, I'm sure they don't know who I am. They just see my face. My own mother has never been social. She'd rather just stay in a room and sleep. And you, your staff always tries to engage her, always invites her. And we'll respect her if she just wants to stay where she is. And that, like, I noticed that from the get go. And it's really meaningful to me because it is what it is. And we have, like, like you just said, just respect where they are and, and not, you know, force her to do anything different. So I just thank you. Thank you and your staff. Oh, you're very welcome. We, we're always striving for that, that person centered individual. Like, we, we want, um, it's like one step beyond the golden rule is our philosophy, the platinum rule. We don't want to do unto others as we want done to us. We want to do unto others as they want done. And that's significantly harder a lot of the time. Yeah, so, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. um, but, but we try. So I really appreciate that. And I'll definitely pass that on to the rest of our team. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I, Courtney, I really like to go on the journey uh, with them, it seems to, it could apply to any of the, you know, mild, middle or late mm -hmm. stages. And mm -hmm. I think it does really help um, with the res respecting, you know, showing respect to them by just going on the journey wherever, mm -hmm. wherever yeah. they're going, <laughs> wherever yeah. their brain is going. So yeah. that that's a really good uh, thing to remember. Just go on the journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, good, great. Yeah. Yeah, because anytime we're trying to correct them, we're likely going to embarrass them. So just, sure. yeah, so I've been, um, I've been a security guard and a social security agent and <laughs> a, um, a cruise director and, <laughs> and, and my, um, my long lost friend, Mary and a million other things, depending on the day and the person, it's, <laughs> it's okay. And it, it's kind of fun. Many hats. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <Very many. laughs> And your turtle, your turtle analogy was very helpful too. Yeah. Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. They seem like such small things, but they really are big and effective. You know, the turtle tactics and the mm -hmm. go on a journey or the therapeutic lying, which you talked about last week. They mm -hmm. seem small, but they, they are huge in their effectiveness and uh, helping us you know, mm -hmm. how to work along with our loved ones. <laughs> I definitely um, didn't know to use the same phrase. Mm -hmm. um, I was 100% guilty of that and it never occurred to me. So that was super helpful, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, do you want the air conditioner on? Nothing. Mm -hmm. Are you cold? Nothing. Are you a little warm? Should we adjust the temperature? Not, I, I didn't realize that that would, you know, just do more confusion. So that was super helpful too. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it's in, it's instinctive. We all do it. And I know I'm even guilty of it from time to time. And I know better. I do this teaching all the time. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just habit. So, but that's good. Yeah. The, the more we can try to be consistent, the better off we're going to be. Yeah. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, um, so I think our topic for next time is going to be hygiene because I know several of you have expressed concern Thank you. about yes. <laughs> um, yeah, about the battles associated with hygiene. Um, yep. So we're going to spend some time next month touching on that in, in much greater detail. Um, we'll talk about how you choose your battles and how you can make those battles a little mm -hmm. more easily won. Um, I won't say that there's a magic bullet for any of it because there's just not, um, but we can also kind of help you figure out what are the battles worth having and when should you be concerned? You know, when, okay. when, is, when does hygiene become a safety issue versus when is it a comfort thing and, and stuff like that. And so we'll kind of go through that in a lot of detail because I know that's something that has come up repeatedly 
um, when we've, I've had conversations with you either in here or in, uh, you know, individually as you've come in to visit or we've talked on the phone, that sort of thing. So Good. Um, I Good. think that'll be a Tuesday next month because Thursdays aren't always convenient for everybody. So I'm going to try to switch mm -hmm. things up, but I'm going to try to keep it evening hours um, so that so that we can still honor those of you that have work and I'll of course do the recording and send that out. So um, thank you. Yeah. So I'll, uh, the recording should be available in a few, usually it takes about a half an hour after we're done. And so I'll likely send that out in the morning and I'll send out the information for our next meeting as well for those of you that want to. Great. Attend. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Thank, thank you. Courtney. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Have a good night, everybody. Have a good, good night. night. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Courtney. You're welcome. Have a good night. Okay. Bye-bye.